very good morning once again. So these are, I would say, the repercussions of a new venue where everybody finds just a little teeny weeny uh, issue to find uh, really where to reach for the conference. Uh, but thankfully, all panelists are here and a couple of them are on the way and should be reaching uh, in here soon. Um, so, you know, our first panel discussion today is really what modern retail um, is and what modern retail, particularly in the omni-channel sense of things, offering as a great opportunity for anybody who wants to see retail as an investment. Um, so I was actually just mentioning a while back that master franchising and multi-unit franchising is going to be very, very large in India because we're already seeing a huge influx of international brands um, whether in and pretty much in every industry. So in fact, this year itself, we've got about 35 countries getting represented over here who are launching their brands for the first time um, in this country. So given that, and particularly from a retail dimension, when we look at it, um, so that's where our uh, next discussion is going to be. Um, so let me start with you, uh, Mr. Bansal. So Mr. Bansal is a veteran in franchising. We always believe, you know, they've uh, built Liberty as a homegrown brand to a very, very large uh, sort of conglomerate in one sense, because now they're not just got uh, you know, their legacy brand, but they're also introducing so many product innovations. They're also bringing so many other, um, you know, changes within the brand, which we would love you for you to talk about, Mr. Bansal, as to, you know, what kind of product innovations you're doing, how are you sort of uh, living up with the consumer, uh, and how are you particularly in your franchise channel network making sure that you introduce those new innovations and also um, make the customer feel, you know, age with the customer, so to say. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I think compliments to Ritu and Franchise India to organize such an Thank amazing you. show and uh, getting 35 uh, countries is definitely pride for India, yes. pride for us. Uh, while, you know, innovators in Franchise, we feel the market is getting ready for a lot of learning yes. uh, and learning in both ways. A, uh, as Liberty, a lot of franchising systems were evolved way back in, I would say, late 80s or early 90s. Uh, there was hardly any interaction available from the international brands. I think consumer has evolved, the franchising partners have evolved, and a lot of learnings for us to take from a lot of international people and, you know, franchising India, which has also evolved so many processes and systems and industry standards earlier, which was not available. So it's, it's very interesting uh, space. And I think with their help and also a lot of international competition, our processes have definitely evolved. At Liberty, uh, I think the biggest challenge is always to keep ourselves younger and on the toes because with old companies where we get an advantage of uh, experience, but the consumer is constantly evolving. So we have to be on toes to keep on innovating. And like the way you uh, rightly said, uh, we have introduced uh, two or three different brands to entail the Zen Z customer. So Leap 7X is the latest in the offering, which is targeted to the Eth Ledger segment and to target more, I would say, uh, younger audience, uh, while it is very difficult to bring the age of the brand lower, but we are trying with this brand, we get uh, Zen Z's more so aged between 20 to, I would say 35 years to get connected to the brand. As far as franchising is concerned, I think it's a very interesting space to engage with the customer where the traditional retail model has to be completely evolved with integrated online experience and enhanced CRM experience and mobility where customer wants us to be present in all the spaces giving similar experience while it's a journey to uh, you know, bridge those gaps. Uh, contrary to a lot of just online players who don't have the baggage of traditional retail uh, system and taking those consumers along. They are giving a lot of advantages uh, because they are only offering online services. So to carefully steer and keep old customers and new customers completely aligned uh, is a journey we walk and uh, we feel we are building very, very robust systems to uh, keep the business model intact and not just drain uh, in the early stages and be very mindful of the old franchise partners and the new franchise partners for them to be profitable rather than just 
losing the competitive edge to just the pure online play customer. I think those are the areas we really focus upon and take all the business partners along in the transformation journey of customer. Sure, and I think uh, you know it's it's a um, it's a, like a new brand itself when you're actually sort of getting younger for the customer. It's like building or rebuilding the brand all over again. So, which we love to talk to you about a little more in a while. Um, you know, Atul. Um, uh, so, I've known Atul for years, and uh, he's done some great work in building brands, international brands in India. And today, he's leading Aqualite in India, which is one of India's leading footwear brand. And um, you know, one thing, of course, I think our audience would be very interesting to know is that you know why a private equity fund would want to invest in Aqualite, and also today, you know, as a fund enters into a um, into a brand, what changes does it bring? And therefore, you know, how do you sort of make sure that the brand sort of becomes um, up there and you know is uh, it 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 sort of gets its momentum and find its growth and expansion in, in every which way. Thank you so much, uh, Ritu. Pleasure to be here in, in the conference uh, and meet all, the, all of you here. You know, coming to the uh, specifics about private equity, franchising and the growth, uh, I think private equity as they come in into any company, one of the biggest motive is to help grow that company at a much faster pace than what they have been doing bringing in systems, processes, uh, even bringing in some new concepts which may or may not have existed, uh, which will help in the top line growth as well as in the profitability growth. For example, franchising, exclusive business outlets, which many companies may, may be having, may not have given it the kind of leg space that is required for it to grow. Uh, you know, I, during my... Uh, experience with Samsung and Orient Electric and other companies as well, I have seen that one thing is clear. In India, in, especially in the last five, seven, eight years, the consumption story is really strong. I mean, it is so strong that even today when we are talking of e-commerce being such a big player, the projections which are coming out is that even by 2030, which is six, seven years from now, the e-commerce will only be 10-12% of the entire retail space. Which means that physical formats, franchising, having physical point of presence is going to be extremely critical in a diverse country like India. So I always keep telling everybody, you have to look at the changing landscape of the consumers. You have to look at how, what consumers are expecting. So they're used to now e-commerce platforms. So they're used to having multiple brands together. So are we looking at an era of multi-franchising under one roof, uh, which so far has not really happened, but is that the future in franchising where you will have Pitman training, direct English, as I see in front of me, and maybe one or two other brands together offering a plethora of choice to the consumer in a physical space. Uh, so I think that those are the evolutions which will happen which all private equity guys always keep on thinking and helping their brands to grow. Sure. Um, so, you know, just as a follow on question, uh, you know, when a private equity uh, enters into a brand, what changes is it that you are first sort of affected in the brand just to make it, I would say, more um, up there uh, with the rest of the industry? I think some of the clear mandates which come in clearly are governance, uh, which needs to be absolutely strengthened and made world class if it is not already there. Aggression in terms of uh, top line and also a focus on profitability. Because the goal is to make the business far more nimble and to make business far more uh, acceptable to outside investors. So I think that's what happens when uh, uh, private equity comes in. And then they also want to bring in a lot more Today's concept, as Mr. Bansal said, are you digitally transformed? Are you working towards transforming yourself to be ready for the future? I think those are the concepts which come in when uh, somebody like an aggressive backer or an aggressive part owner comes into the, into the company. And this is all for the good of the business. Yeah, it's absolutely. something which helps the businesses to grow, to yeah. become more nimble and more profitable. I mean, if you're somebody is following the news, then you know, why Haldiram is in news is only because of that. So, yes. you know, from a humble brand which started in Nagpur, 
um, many years ago. Today, it is probably one of the blue-eyed of private equity world. So and it's also pr probably one of the most successful global food brands from yes. India. Yes, absolutely. You know, who would have thought of that? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Atul. I'm going to come on to Mansi. So, beauty industry in India, Mansi has just taken off. Like, you know, it's in a different sphere altogether. I mean, today, if you look at the ground floor of any mall, all you really see is beauty brands. Uh, you know, what earlier used to be only clothing brands has been taken over by beauty as a segment. Even, you know, when you see all uh, big departmental stores, you see that their first sort of the opening entrance is only beauty. Um, so, you know, according to you, what sort of brought the beauty wave into the country, um, particularly in a big way post-COVID? That is one. And secondly, you know, you're a digital first brand. You started digitally, but now you've gone omni-channel. Now you sort of, as uh, Mr. Bansal was saying that, you know, it's a big country and therefore, you know, the touch points are very important. The store is very important in our country. So where, where, where and when did you feel the need to actually start doing bodice stores in malls? And how did it change, um, you know, the entire trajectory for you for more consumer face-to-face? Percy, thank you so much. My name is Mansi Sharma. I am the creative director of uh, House of Brands, uh, House of Beauty, in which we exclusively franchise the Body Shop, Kiehl's, Kylie Cosmetics, Max Factor. And now, of course, we have our own multi-brand as we have, uh, you know, an entire House of Brands. You're absolutely right. Uh, I think beauty has exploded and how in the last decade, but more so in the last uh, five years. Uh, and even if you just look at the D2C space of Indian beauty brands, uh, in the last one year, there have been 800 D2C brands that have been launched, out of which a significant chunk are beauty brands. And I think the primary reason for this is because the Indian consumer, the Indian beauty consumer, A, has become more financially independent. You have more women in the workforce who have more discretionary spending. Uh, the women of our mother's generations used to take pride in a lack of self-care, in a lack of indulging in things like beauty products, cosmetics, lipsticks. And, and I still remember the time when I used to be told that we had one lipstick hua karti thi, aur usi se hum blush and one cream and we used to use it. And today there's a pride in, in taking care of yourself, in serving yourself before serving others. Um, so that is one. The second is, of course, the discretionary spending. Uh, despite a slightly quieter last quarter, the overall discretionary spend, uh, you know, uptake has been significant. And, you know, where fashion and apparel at times fledgles, beauty is only growing at 18 to 20 percent and will continue to for the next five years. Um, and the reasons for this is because, A, there are newer markets that are certain, su suddenly, you know, T2 cities that have access, that have knowledge, that have social media, that know what niacinamide is, that know what Korean beauty brand benefits are, that know what the newest color cosmetics brands are. I mean, when we launched Kylie Cosmetics less than a month ago, the kind of search trends that we got from tier two, tier three cities for a brand by Kylie Jenner, who's a right. Kardashian sitting in LA, is immense. And I think that's because of higher time spent on social media. Coming to your point about uh, offline retail, actually our roots are in offline. We have over 200 stores of the body shop. We have 20 stores yeah. of Kiehl's. Uh, so we really understand the power of the BA, the power of a significant location in a mall, the power of your visual merchandising, of making a brand and bringing it into the palms of Indians, of making a global brand Indianized and localized and something that is compelling for the Indian consumer. Right. So I absolutely agree. I think where people will discover you online, you know, you can do push marketing and spend thousands and thousands of rupees on online ads. The kind of credibility, the kind of education, the visibility and the buy-in that you get from offline, from entering a store and feeling a brand and touching a product is something that is yet to be replaced. And yes. that's why we see the biggest brands in the market, despite offline retail sales going down, uh, brands investing more and more in offline real estate because they know that when you have more space, uh, when you have, you know, things like, for example, a trial station at the body shop, we now have equipped the top, you know, 20 stores with a sink for people to come and, you know, try our shower gels, for people to come and try our face washes. Um, that results maybe in the same amount of footfall, but a higher conversion. Because it is a more profitable business model. The offline model is more profitable. You may not be able to play the discount game as ruthlessly as you do online. 
Um, but it, it's added immensely to the credibility of our brand. So we, we definitely have a pro offline strategy for both our newer brands, our in, you know, in home brands like The Honestry uh, and our global brands as well. So, and you're now yeah. planning to take body stores across the country? Yes, actually. And, and one of our primary strategies is to take it into tier two, tier three markets because right. the kind of purchasing power uh, that sits there, you know, our, you know our, one of our most profitable squares, uh, stores per square foot is in Itanagar. And you have people in Itanagar and Agartala looking for ingredients like salicylic acid, looking for Kylie Cosmetics, looking for Anastasia Beverly Hills. So the kind of appetite that rests there is yet to be tapped into and I think we're just we're just scratching the surface right now as an industry. Totally. I think beauty industry has just started. We're going to see much more of it in the coming time. So thanks for sharing that, Pansi. I'm going to come on to you, Shruti. So Shruti's joined us here from Invest India. Thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, she leads the retail and the e-commerce vertical, the consumer facing industries at Invest India. So particularly, uh, Shruti, what is it that you're doing at Invest India to help the retail industry? You know, you, we've uh, seen Mansi talking about how they are sort of bringing a lot of international global brands in the beauty space in India. And now they want to take it across sort of India and Bharat everywhere. So, and I mean, you know, you see over here, there are about 500 brands present today and majority of them in retail. So just like a lot of international brands want to come to India, a lot of Indian brands also want to go global, particularly where there is a very large Indian diaspora, like a Middle East market or a London or such market. So, you know, at Invest India, how are you helping the retail industry? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So my name is Shruti. Uh, I look at the retail, e-commerce and consumer goods uh, sectors at Invest India. Just to explain, Invest India is the national investment promotion and facilitation arm of the uh, government. Uh, we are fully funded by Ministry of Commerce and our mandate is to act as the first point of contact for companies, both global and domestic companies that are looking to expand into India and also need support you know, going global as well. Uh, so just to explain, you know, we work with companies throughout their investment life cycle, whether, you know, when you're looking at India or you don't know about India, giving you the information in terms of, you know, what is the consumer landscape like? What are the policies in India, the FDI policy in India, supporting you with any knowledge that you require? Um, once you're, con you know, once you're looking at entering India, then supporting you with any licenses or any operational challenges that you may be facing. And the idea here is also to work with you on your ease of doing business issues. So this could be operational issues or supporting you with any policy, advocacy, etc. that you require as well. Um, I've been at Invest India for nine years now, uh, looking at the retail e-commerce uh, sectors. And uh, primarily the work that we do to your question is that uh, you know, there are a lot of companies that are looking at India. You know, Mansi talked about beauty sector. We've, we've, you know, we've talked about athleisure, for example. So we've worked with companies who want any support in terms of their India entry strategy right. from the government side. So we, you know, think of us as the concierge from the government to work with companies, both global and Indian, who require any sort of support to make their expansion into India easier. Uh, the second part is, of course, that we're also now working very actively with domestic companies to help them go global as well. Right. And where we can support is, you know, any in, in, in terms of, you know, any uh, connects that they require with the Indian embassies, so who can then help them with, con you know, connecting them with associations there or finding them partners, etc. as well. So the idea is to be that one stop shop for, you know, across segments in the retail sector and provide any sort of support that the government can provide them to make sure that there is job creation in the country, there is ease of doing business. And, uh, you know, a, a investor that is invests in India is also, you know, if they have a good experience, they become our brand ambassadors for India as well. So I think that's a very important part because, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, the life cycle of the retail sector. In the beginning, you had the likes of Uniqlo, et cetera, that came, entered. But then after that, that's given a lot of confidence to other brands now who are actively looking at India. And I think similarly in all segments, you're seeing that. You know, if you look at beauty segment as well, Mansi, I, I think, uh, you know, you'll concur with me that, uh, you know, 
in the beginning Nike brought in a few brands but i think the success and the uh, you know that they see in india and the consumer story that india is today i think you know a lot of brands are interested in india and uh, you know i i think uh, i tell my md every time that i think i have the easiest sector there is to promote because you know the consumer story is the most important story there is no i think you i agree and the penetration in india is of course uh, very big opportunity you know trying to sort of address and as you said the tier 2 tier 3 cities are now becoming you know the metros of india when it comes to consumption so they people don't want to travel to delhi to buy something fancy they would rather want to buy it where they're sitting so the opportunity for brands to expand therefore becomes as much bigger okay um so you know mr grad has joined us from usa and he is the founder of bella cures which is actually a very cult uh beauty brand in the hand and feet salon space um you know it's a sector which we have seen in the last one one and a half year uh growing but you know uh when i read about your brand i also saw about how you sort of um uh, you know your consumers are very ultra high celebrities uh you know high net worth women out there very senior professionals who come for these services So how do you see this brand coming to India and expanding in India and what is it about the consumer that you've noticed over there in your market in USA which you think has similarities here in India as well Yes uh first of all thank you for having me um well to address what you were saying uh, when Belloker started out when Belloker started out uh we elevated what uh, the level of cleanliness that was experienced so the first people to notice it were celebrities uh we were open in los angeles which is their neighborhood but uh those clientele the higher end were the ones that were more careful and noticed that we do not use anything twice everything is single wrapped even the creams we produce ourselves open for you and disposed there's no double dipping the level of cleanliness just went up and the demand for better service just came up as as we did we we now have a lot of copycats and so but but people people know that we were there first um i believe that that demand for better care for more cleanliness for safer and um for for a guaranteed product that you can go to not just to one salon but if you are across town and there's a Bella Cures there you can count on the same service you can go and get your nail fixed and so on which is what a lot of clients do in Los Angeles where we have seven salons and um yeah they like to frequent and know that it's always the same standard yeah so you've also built it as a very influencer led brand you know because i found that you know you've got um, all big celeb stars who come to your stores and uh, therefore you know a lot of other people also want to visit your stores so um, so how you know so what was the core philosophy when you started it why how did you make it like you know up there the cult that you brought into it in all sincerity i mean we we posted the best works that we did but people just posted out of their heart uh lebron james was there and his wife posted it and put it up on instagram and it got you know it's just people just do it because they like the service they are in the mood uh we get a lot of uh, paparazzi sometimes waiting for the celebrities going out uh we never call but a lot of p- places in Los Angeles do we don't but uh we get a lot of also press and instagram because of that so yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah, that's great and i think you know we have a full bollywood out here so there, there is no dearth of people coming and visiting you once you open up here uh okay i'm going to come on to you abhay um so abhay of course leads clovia uh, which is the lingerie brand and which has seen some massive growth um, in india today so particularly we've seen your stores growing over the last years you know i know you were one of the earliest d2c brands who went into the store strategy the omni channel strategy while i understand in the product itself lends to you know a touch point a physical touch point where people can you know try and buy and so on but 
I mean, you know, you went so aggressively with it in terms of store opening. So how are you now balancing your digital as well as your store growth uh, together? And where do you see the biggest traction coming? So uh, good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm uh, co-founder and CFO, COO at Clovia. And so I'll come to the question. The we were the first, one of the first uh, online first brand that started back in 2012. And back then, there was no offline story. And uh, for, at least for D2C online brands, we were like, we will create a new market, we will go online and we will differentiate from the current existing brands. And the competition was always jockey, right? Competition was never, uh, uh, never an online brand. Actually, there was no online brand, but uh, competition was not, was the convenient bit was there was no competition existing. But why we went online first was a more, this, this business is more supply chain driven. So, so for you to go online first is much easier than to go offline first because online you can, you can try with 50 pieces of one style, do a dip check and if it works, if there is traction, of course you bring volume and you bring customers to the website and if, so we give, we sell in value packs. We say you can choose four for this price any four of the articles. So the customer goes and now you know which one the customer is liking and choosing. So that way it tells us which SKU is selling. We sell about 90,000 SKU. So that's a huge width. But why we went offline now is that once we got the customer, we knew we had a certain level of, you know, a, a best sellers, fast sellers. We knew what will sell then we knew that the expansion is not possible with just offline because end of the day offline is only an X percentage of the total market, right? And it continues to be so and we believe it will, we'll also follow the US market or any other market in the world uh, across where maximum penetration even in the US today is about 20-22%, right? So, so you want to capture the 80% and serendipity as, as luck would have it, we are now part of Reliance as one of the uh, biggest D2C exits in the country. Uh, we are today present in 1200 Alliance Trend stores and the plan is to go to 2500 all Reliance Trend stores, Centro, Fashion Factory, Smarts, etc. A lot of formats that Alliance operates and we also have our stores. The plan this year is to open about 300 stores. So today online still contributes 60% of my business. But five years hence, the model is offline will do 60%. So, so you know where the turn of events is. The growth is in offline. That's what. Since you mentioned Reliance, so Reliance is one of our first booths out there in, uh, in the exhibition. And of course, you know, um, and they all want to open and everybody wants to franchise to open it more quickly. Um, so, and you know, Mr. Bansal here has been a champion of that growth, particularly not just now, but also from before. So, you know, uh, Mr. Bansal, how did franchising help you to take a, a quicker spread in the country? And how were you able to sort of reach to, as I said, both India and Bharat because you used franchising very early on and you still continue to use it? So definitely uh, <clears throat> uh, franchising was a great uh, mode to grow, A, to bring uh, you know, knowledge, local knowledge, which is most important to uh, make retail successful because you need to have a client base and a local influence. And I think each franchisee comes with his local uh, influence and also to leverage your capital and your strengths because, you know, the way a franchisee uh, manages uh, compared to like a, a cocoa store whereby it is easier for an entrepreneur to make work than uh, for an employee to uh, work. So I think those are the advantages which a franchisee definitely comes in. Obviously, it comes with its own challenge also because they are entrepreneurs. So they calculate everything on uh, ROI basis and they don't have a uh, long term view, you know, which a company sometimes wants uh, you to, you know, take a slightly long term view. So I think expansion wise franchising is a great model. At the same time, I would like to be cautious to uh, balance the two because, you know, as a brand, we need to balance and bring the right standards 
sometimes and they become a, a showcase for the franchise network to follow and you keep on uh, you know balancing the two so that profitability growth and uh, brand experience all three should go hand in hand I'll just say that franchising is absolutely the way to go if you want to really make your brand more and more visible, acceptable and approachable to all the consumers. Uh, the, the challenge will come in when the number of SQs is very large and as uh, Ms. Bansal said, uh, the ROI of the local entrepreneur starts getting uh, coming into play. So keeping all kinds of stocks, all kinds of SQs to satisfy the consumer in a small tier 2, tier 3 location uh, becomes a big challenge. So I think that's where uh, uh, smart management practices and that's where some of the tech is coming in and helping us as to what moves, what does not move in those locations. And you manage your working capital and you manage your products in such a way that they satisfy the requirements of uh, Muradabad as well as the requirements of Thrissur, which is in south, where the colors, the combinations, the sizes are very different compared to what Muradabad would need. So I think uh, combination of tech with this uh, franchise model of going offline, both of them will lead to winners for particular brands to go to tier 2 and tier 3 places. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think uh, digitization as well as physical stores is the uh, way to go when it comes to actually building your distribution. And if I may add, uh, Ritu, uh, what Mansi said earlier, you know, in the last 8-10 years, uh, we're seeing this Indian consumer uh, getting and getting used to and wanting to, you know, try out. You know, I just have a slightly different uh, take on it, which is the Indian consumer has been evolving for the last 20-30 years. But to me, what has really changed in the last 15 years or last 12, 13 years is again the evolution in tech, the platforms which have become available, the technology, the smartphones which have become available and the social which has become available, which is allowing these consumers to be reached and tapped by the brands. And they are now able to see even in a small place, which you mentioned, that okay, the, all these kinds of products are available at this price, they can discover the pricing, they can discover the product. So I think the catalyst is technology. It's not that the consumer has suddenly changed in the last 10 years. Consumer has been aspirational. Yeah, it has become more, uh, the GDPs are growing faster now. That's of course true and they are also going deeper down. Yeah, yeah. but it's the tech which has actually enabled 800 D2C brands which you mentioned in the last 8-10 years really go down into the hinterland. Earlier on also, I started Kalabar in 2004-05. Many of you might be aware of that brand. 2004-05, I had no access to tech. There was no way that you could go online D2C. Okay. So Kalabar 24-7, which again I was a co-founder, uh, we in 2005-06, Consumers still wanted it, but there was no way to reach the consumer. There were no influencers, there was no social media. And it was so expensive to go down to a small town and actually set up an outlet there. But today, if I were to start that business, for me, very easy to go D2C and actually say, okay, I'll first get my consumers here. So I think I give the credit to tech and the evolution which has happened. That was my take on it. So I think I would like to add, like, technology is definitely very, very important. And at Liberty, I would like to share experience where Liberty was always been very technologically evolved, but the down to line implementation was always a challenge. And I think now involving franchisee and network to implement and take the technology forward has been really, really fruitful. Earlier, like we implemented SAP or an ERP and getting consumer data way back in 2000. But the franchises were not even willing to put a POS system uh, at their stores and to collect data and give it because they always thought this is their knowledge and they would always be scared. Today, I think technology has opened up for them to trust the company and share back the data and use it and how you make them the partners in the process. Even when it is online, initially we were facing challenge where franchisee always thought that the business will go down and the company will, will have an alternate channel and their margins would get eroded. So how smartly you make them the partners in that online journey and the growth journey is an important part that how you keep on 
rather than calling them just a franchise partner more like a business partner so that you keep on evolving their aspirations to whatever growth journey you have and see how they can partner in your growth journey holistically rather than just for that pure retail store yeah i think just to add to this one of the most uh, interesting statistics i i recently read is that 80% of online purchases from the top 20 re online retailers in the country have been made on a smartphone so 100% this is credit to the technology as you've spoken additionally india is one of the largest markets for software that um that completes coupon purchases and cashback purchases we are one of the largest markets in the world for that so i personally while i'm you know i'm very excited about the online story and it has been the bread and butter of one of our new brands the honest tree i think we also have to keep in mind that the indian consumer at the end of the day is a value driven consumer it doesn't matter how great your ui ux is it doesn't matter what your brand is it doesn't matter what ingredient you use if you are below or above if you are above a certain price point you will not sell <laughs> online and if we're looking at platforms uh you know while we are talking about premiumization and hyper personalization the online game is a discount game and i think any new brand that is looking at least in the beauty space that is looking to enter the market needs to understand that it is the battle of the discount to an extent online which is why the offline presence comes in for the differentiation your online presence your social media presence comes in for the advocacy um and yeah i think this is this is something that you because any time you start a business you need to look at the pnl and see where where your largest cost is going to go and you need to understand that if you are working with platforms it is the battle of the discount so i think i would like to understand and also comment on uh, over the past i would say 5 years while i understand online really started with a discount game and a lot of market share was lost but i think today when i look at online players i think they are mindful of it and they are not really burning and even uh, peas are not helping them uh, to burn that much i would just use a experience of my personal online just two days back just a ice cream cup ordered which sounded so simple when i was actually reading at the details of the invoice i was paying almost 75 rupees for just the convenience of getting it so earlier which was discount now all the online places are charging convenience fee or some kind of a fee to make them profitable so are you talking about quick commerce or e-commerce both on e-commerce and quick commerce so i checked blinkit also and i checked zomato also so i think blinkit becomes more quick so commerce. quick commerce will charge you that premium for the delivery that sure. will that will be there now actually beauty brands are also on blinkit because we were like what the hell if the iphone can be on blinkit then who are we to not you know be on okay. blinkit but i'm talking about the e-commerce when you're looking at a certain brand and you're looking at a nike versus tira versus sephora uh it is the same sku but it's it's that gamification for the consumer as well so today i would say it's the age of the consumer uh who is spoiled for choice uh and and it is us brands who are trying to you know fit so that mold so as a as a brand we would like to be sure that we want to be mindful of not offering too much discounts or encouraging too much discounts online because we are mindful that the online or oh sorry offline stores have to make money and the customer we as a brand we would not want them to shift we want it to be convenient so that they can have a similar experience at both the places rather than creating an advantage for them and we generally discourage them rather than trying to encourage them in fact if i can add on this if you are a very well distributed uh, brand already in india which i guess liberty is it, online is a very double edged sword because if you actually go online and they and they discount the prices the entire chain of stores and entire chain of distributors will actually go up in arms so it it has to be balanced very nicely both the channels yeah. uh, otherwise the company may actually get into a lot of issues sure so i mean i also want to touch upon general trade you know i think the big opportunity always continues to always remain particularly um, um, atul for aqualite you know how big is general trade as a category for you and you know uh, mansi mentioned about the certain price points which always work very well for indian consumers do they work better in a more exclusive sort of uh, place exclusive retail uh, store or do they work better in a more general um, retail or general trade environment uh ritu again uh, for brands which are targeting the bharat of india which is they're looking at mass pricing mass products for them 
it is extremely important that general trade is very big because that's where they're able to showcase their products, get loyalty from the retailers and actually build up a long term business because they're working on very high value for the consumer at a very low pricing. So the margins and all tend to get very compromised at the manufacturer level itself. It's very difficult to go into big discounting by going online there. So general trade for, I would say, organized come unorganized industries in apparels, in footwear, in clothing, etc. will always remain very critical. Because that's the only place where they can actually showcase thousands of SKUs, colors, sizes, uh, which need to be actually sold to the consumer at the lowest possible price. So yes, general trade is very, very critical. Sure. Uh, we're happy to take some questions also from the audience in case they would like to ask any particular speaker any question. Uh, but, you know, continuing this discussion, um, I know we're running short on time. So, um, Shruti, uh, you know, now that we see that there is a um, big sort of opportunity on both sides of the spectrum, whether it is physical retail and, you know, I don't mean just the store, but general trade and uh, you know, going looking at Bharat as one opportunity and India as another, and then you have e-commerce. So, you know, when do you at any point of time suggest, let's say, if Liberty was to come to you and they want to go outside, would you tell them that to first go in a more digital environment in another country before they start setting up stores over there? So, uh, you know, being a part of government we would not be able to say that uh, you know you can you should choose one particular model or not and of course that's a business decision but i think if you look at the global trend uh, you know you can't you can't ignore any of the channels today you know that's that's a fact um, i i think any company that is looking has to look at the particular country that they're going into and then decide whether you know it's uh, you know what model or they want to follow but i think the general trend is that uh, you know you know whether you start e-commerce first or whether you start the physical store first they have to marry each other at some point you know even if you look at you know companies like apple etc they did start e-commerce then they started their physical store in fact you know one of the changes in the fdi policy was to encourage a lot of companies that uh, you know are looking at entering e-commerce but then also want to set up sbrt as well so i think uh, you know a very short answer to your question would be that you know both channels are important it's a personal uh, commercial decision that the company has to make but i would definitely recommend that they look at the country they're entering when they go global and then decide what is uh, you know uh, where, where they see more more sales and where the consumer is going i think in india's case of course it is you know both channels are very important um, and i think the uh, the crux of the discussion today has been that the indian consumer is very conscious of what they're doing uh, e-commerce technology has definitely enabled them to be more aware aspiration was already there but i think e-commerce and and the fact that now you know india has become uh, you know a global leader as well i think uh, you know that is also added to the aspiration of the indian consumer as well because they are going global this they're becoming uh, you know they're getting educated they're traveling outside so you know their their ability to decide and dis decipher uh, you know what is the deal that they're getting is also much more so I think it's very important for brands to look at both channels. Yeah. So uh, for Clovia, you know, did general distribution also play a big role uh, or general trade play a big role in helping you decide that you needed to open more stores and more touch points? We as a brand, Ritu, had a different thought process and I know time is out, so I'll keep it short. We always wanted to be one hop to the customer. So between us and the customer, we only wanted one hop, so maximum. So what we did is, and, and when you go to distribution, what you end up doing is there is first the distributor and then there's the retailer and then there's the customer. So there are two hops. And what happens between that is, first of all, there is there's no data. And for us, new age businesses, new age minds, people who play with technology, who are made out of technology, Today we are selling lingerie, but we just launched John Player is into Innerwear as well, right? So we just moved to men's just like that. Now we are launching kids as well. Now we are launching Lee Cooper Innerwear as well. So with Reliance, the 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 width is amazing, but 
for us to go to general trade and i i kind of differ with you on that we could never offer a lot of skus in general trade today we we have 90000 skus online in my store i do about 8000 skus in my ebo in trends also i do 400 500 skus but in general trade i can only have 40 skus right because the retailer doesn't have enough space to keep all that skus so and the box and the material has to be in the boxes so that's an added cost i have to take out the margin of the distributor of the retailer which earlier i enjoyed fully right so my gross margin goes down my cost and my co- management cost goes up in general trade so it may be just a bend of mind but without shying away from the channel we are general trade today in this year's plan is a big part of my plan because i know that howsoever much i talk about all of this general trade is a big part of who are, who we are and as a brand apparel brand in uh, at least for our business and uh, may differ from the other businesses for our brand to go to general trade first of all you need to be neatly priced you can't be too discounted so we we made a strategy where we said we will have a different range for online and a different range for offline because online you discount offline you don't and you can't because you won't survive so offline you need to have a gross margin of at least 70% today we do about 70% gross margin in our category that's very good and second you need to have limited skus so that was our strategy uh, jared do you also retail products separately and your sort of in because obviously it's a service format in which you provide those nail and feed services but you also said you have a product line so do you also retail the product line no no not right now the products that we produce are for our own consumption for your own consumption. uh but i have seen how in the last 10 years uh i went from calling places like a mall and asking if uh, they had a space for us and then hanging up on me uh to now having every mall put us in their plan because they need services to bring people in because of all the online sales because of all the online sales so now what's happened in america especially in los angeles you see that every mall wants a gym wants yoga wants uh, boxing wants nail salons wants to bring to the retailer the consumer Yeah. Um I'm going to I've been actually told about the time uh, but any question we can take maybe one or two questions very quickly if there are any can you please pass on the mic to the gentleman Hello So really nice uh, session you know a lot of insights after MBA days uh any one of you can answer my question uh, and uh, it's related to tech data because that is the field i come from so you know like a lot of data being scraped nowadays and amazon specifically scrapes a lot of retailers data before they do their sales they change the price and as mansi mentioned you know a lot of data they used to do discounts and all now just want to understand in terms of offline channels the re- retail stores what sort of data you guys are utilizing to uh you know maybe price prediction or demand forecasting and you know more personalization stuff you know related to how you can personalize the product specifically to the customers in the case of do you have a particular industry you're inter- interested in or just yeah, yeah. any one of you so can in the case provide of, more insights related yeah to in the case of beauty i think uh your bas are your eyes and ears into the brand so your your training starts right from the forecast of the ba understanding which products are moving which products are not moving what customers are demanding in addition um and it is up until you know 5 to 10 years ago it was a much more manual process today you have purchasing data you have visibility data you have uh, all sorts of touch points within the store you because of omni channel there are people who look up you know certain sku certain products certain ranges online order it to offline um and it is essentially the training of the ba that you have to inculcate to have them be your eyes and your ears to the customer 
because a lot of customers, what they don't ask online, they will ask to the BA, for example, does this product have sulfates? Does this product have parabens? Um, and that kind of conversation and that kind of, you know, interaction with the store manager is what comes back to you. More experiential, right? So more, more experiential, you know, like... Yes, completely. And that's why offline is still expanding despite, uh, you know, somewhat of the cannibalization into online sales as well. Because people are looking for those touch points, because they want to be educated by that BA to understand what will this, what personalized need will this product serve for me? Thank you. I'll just add to this that um, over the last 8-10 years, uh, a lot of hard data is coming in also, uh, basis sellout. So if you're able to link up your stores uh, through, I, I think one of you mentioned here, through either a DMS or some kind of a software, it's possible to also get actual sellout from large stores. But it's very difficult to get it implemented at the store level. But what most companies are doing is that at least at the distributor level, they know what is the exact data in terms of movement and they're able to make their strategies basis that. And at the store level, wherever there are, in case of beauty, for example, beauty advisors, in case of electronics, there are these store staff which is available who actually give you ex hard data which comes back to the central place where a small team would pour over it and actually look at the trends as to what the consumer is buying. But yes, we are progressing towards a very data-focused economy, but we are still not there. It is still a, a, a few years away uh, before we can say that we are absolutely on data-focused uh, way of working. That's my take on it. I can add a one small bit uh, of an actual thing that we did. So when we wanted to open a store uh, in a city, what we did, and uh, this is contradictory to our uh, initial thought, what, what we saw is if in a pin code we are selling well, and if we open that store, and if you open a store in that pin code, our online sales will move to offline sales. But that didn't happen. The overall sales only increased in that pin code, right? So that's one data point. At the store level, what we did is, uh, and um, uh, training the sales girl is a tough job, right? Once you have 1,500, 2,000 of them, it's a tough thing to train and to make sure all of them are on the same page. So what we did is a very simple thing. When a customer wanted to try a piece, she doesn't have to do much. She just has to say, the customer tried this. We gave her an app. The customer tried this piece and the customer didn't buy or bought or gave any feedback. That's all the, that she, so you have actual trial data vis-a-vis -vis a pause that only gives you billing data, right? So that's one insight. On the retailer bit, of course, uh, I agree that it's impossible to get even the distributor to use the same software that you are using. So that that channel, of course, is uh, we, we are very, very, and that's the Reliance strategy as well. Reliance says if you can make 20%, sell it to the general trade and say we don't know you after that. So, you know, make the payment, take the goods and after that no returns, no talking. So. General trade is a tough business to be in, but once it takes off, it takes off. You know, he will know best. Well, thank you so much for these wonderful insights. I think uh, some great powerful uh, data points shared here uh, by all our panelists. And uh, as, as they've all mentioned, retail is an emerging, now emerging in its right sense in India where brands are looking at opportunity all across and that is where franchising will also play a very large role in it. So thank you to everyone for joining us here today and making it a special panel. Thank you again.